Tom, how are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you, Chris. Very well. How are you? Yes, wonderful. Thanks so much for joining us at such um, short notice, Tom. I really appreciate it. No, not at all. Great to be on. Thank you. Uh, thank you for finding some time in your busy, uh, your busy diary for uh, to have a nice chat. Yeah, well, I, I, I got another thank you for you, which is you were really kind to do a quote for my upcoming book. For people watching, it's is it? It should be up there on my podcast overlay. It's called State of Mind, which is a Royal Marines slogan, um, and it's the story of how I ran. 999 miles pretty much non-stop bar sleeping in a tent at the side of the road and Tom very kindly um, did a what we call in writing terms a blurb quote so thank you very much mate. No not at all I think it's uh, I think it's so important it's very easy in sort of modern society to to see these incredible things going on and to not take much interest, especially when it's an endurance thing and I'm an endurance athlete and I want, I don't, I want people to talk about me. I want all of this and because that's what your life is, but actually to be able to sit back and be like, wow, what that is done is yes. It's something completely different in endurance, endurance nonetheless, Mm -hmm. but yeah, it's incredibly impressive. And I think the more that people can, can see about it and to understand that, it was a state of mind. It's not just a catchy title for a book. It's so much more, it's so much deeper. And I think it's, yeah, I think anything that I can do to, to try and spare that message, I think, and in, as an endurance sport, as you know, yes, physically it's tough, but it's the mental, it, yeah, the mental barriers are the ones that are hard, much harder to overcome. Yes. So for me, for our friends at home, it really was a state of mind because I'm not like Tom. I'm not one of these fitness guys that, you know, I, I wish I was. I wish I had more time for it. I wish I had my, uh, my stopwatch on and I was watching my times get better and blah, blah, blah. But as people know, I, 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 I believe in, in, in moderate fitness for everybody. I'm very passionate about alkaline lifestyle and diet because it's done so much for my um, personal health but when I did the length of the country I'd been uh, disabled with a a spinal issue for two years so I couldn't do any training what I want to talk to Tom about today is something completely different Tom is an ultra uh, ultra runner which basically um, means running extremely long distances in very fast times up against the best in the world and Tom is the best in the world because he's in um, the very highest echelon of which I'm guessing Tom the people kind of go from number one to number five from number five to number three depending on how they they place in these iconic races yeah, it's, it's really difficult to uh, sort of quantify your world ranking because ultra running is such a, one, it's a fairly new sport, but two, it's a very unique sport that each race is different. And for those who don't know, an ultra marathon is just anything that is longer than a marathon. So anything longer than 26 miles would be classed as an ultra marathon, whether that was 27 miles or 100 miles. And obviously, a 100-mile race around the Mont Blanc Massif will be very different to a 50-mile race on the South Downs Way in the UK and will suit some athletes better than others. So it's very difficult to... They're both ultra marathons, but one person who would win one might not win the other. So it's really difficult to sort of to say like, yeah, this is, this is where I'm ranked globally in a sport that hasn't really got a national governing body or anything. So yeah, it's been a, uh, it's been a whirlwind journey. Um, I think it's probably the, probably the best. And yeah, I've had some, I've had some great results. I've had some not quite so good results as I was doing my apprenticeship into ultra running, I would say. Um, and yeah, it's just been, yeah, one, one crazy journey so far and, Hopefully it can can keep can keep continuing, um, and yeah, I'm just having 
having the absolute time of my life can't really sort of believe that believe that it's happening and you were an officer in in which regiment tom uh so i was an officer in the welsh guards um i commissioned in 2012 um and then yeah joined went straight to the welsh guards um they had just got back from afghanistan um from herrick 16 uh, their sort of second proper tour to Afghanistan. So I, it was a very difficult time to join the battalion as I was 19 when I joined. Uh, I was the youngest in my platoon. I was the only one who had not been to Afghanistan. Um, and so, yeah, it was a, it was a huge, huge challenge um, joining when I did. Um, but a very, very rewarding one. Um, not the sort of career that I sort of, thought or expected to have sort of going through training everything was so Afghanistan focused but I sort of joined in sort of the end of Afghanistan era I guess um and yeah huge huge challenges but incredibly rewarding mm. so you know my friend Simon Weston then Simon Weston or you'll you'll at least be familiar with him yeah no I know sort of Simon I wouldn't say I wouldn't say well. We probably sort of wouldn't. He wouldn't send me a WhatsApp and we'd meet down in the pub. But uh, yeah, I've met him. Met him a couple of times. Uh, yeah, really, really nice. And yeah, lots. I've got lots, lots of time for Simon. He probably would WhatsApp you, mate. He'd be like, "Tom, come <laughs> and get the beers in." <laughs> yeah, probably, probably would. Maybe, uh, maybe next season. <laughs> and was that where, from what I gather from the, the the reading that I've done about you, you came to the sport sort of quite quickly. Um, it wasn't like a huge, great build up and you were. Yeah, so it was a it was a really interesting start. Like, I'd, I guess if I take it a step back, I I'd always been really sporty when I was at school. Um, and then that was also one of the things that drew me into the military. I wanted to I wanted to keep playing sports because I enjoyed it. And predominantly I'd always played team sports, rugby, football, cricket, hockey, um, but also ran and in the sort of school, I would always sort of win the school cross country and, but would never really think much of it. I would just ran to be fit for team sports and that's sort of how it worked. And then joined the army and sort of played, played rugby and obviously the Welsh guards being Welsh are a very rugby orientated um, unit. So played lots of rugby and sort of played for the army at under 23 level. Um, and so sort of just got to the point in my career that I just couldn't, rock up to work on Monday morning sort of with a black eye and sort of cuts on my face and sort of be hobbling about sort of trying to do sort of unit PT and things. So at that point I've decided, right, I need, I need to find another challenge. Um, and I sort of thought, right, well, I enjoy the, I enjoy endurance. I like testing myself. I like sort of push myself mentally and physically. And so I sort of thought, right, what's the hardest, what's the hardest thing that I can do? So having never done a triathlon before, I signed up to Ironman Wales. Um, I did Ironman Wales and off a very, very little training at all. I did one, one swim in the sea, 100 mile bike ride and a couple of loops running around Richmond Park. Um, running and incredibly naive and found it tough, but, but, did reasonably well, finished fourth in my age group, missed out on going to the world championships by, I think, four minutes, um, which I had, I had no idea there was a world championships or anything. So it was all, it was all great fun. And then Kona. Yeah. Yeah. In, um, in Hawaii. In Hawaii. Yeah. So, and that was, that was great. And so that sort of did that and didn't think, didn't think too much of it afterwards. And from there got a little bit more into running and it was only in 2016 when I had two, army friends uh, who were both in the Welsh Guards who did the race marathon de Saab, um, multi-stage race across the Sahara Desert. And they did really well. They finished in the top 300. Um, and when they got back, sort of said, out of having a couple of beers one evening, said, oh yeah, you guys did really well, but I'm, I'm fitter than you guys. I could do, I could do so much better as you do in, for, with your mates. And so sort of one thing led to another and slightly hung over the next morning. I think I, uh, I ended up signing up to the 2017 edition of Marathon de Saab. Um, and fast forward six months, I'm there, stood on the, stood on the start line of Marathon de Saab um, in the Sahara Desert in Morocco. 
about to sort of do my first proper ultra marathon. Um, so, so yeah, very much jumping in at the deep end, very naive. Yes, I had a training plan, but I wrote it myself and the kit that I was wearing definitely wasn't sort of the most state of the art. It was sort of what can I beg, borrow and, and steal off friends. Um, and yeah, it was just a, yeah, pretty, a pretty crazy journey and sort of ended up being, you ended up being sort of the first non sub saharan African male to, to finish on the podium, um, which was incredibly unexpected. So I went wanting to finish maybe top 20. And after a couple of days, it was all the sort of the top Brits to finish. Like there's only I think one or two Brits to finish in the top 10, like, or maybe I could sort of finish in the top 10. And I remember watching the James Cracknell documentary when he did, and he was the, the leading Brit finishing 11th for, for quite a while. And yeah, so just days sort of went by and sort of found that I was getting better and better as the days went on. And yeah, just an amazing experience to then get back to the UK and be offered to do and to compete in some races. And I'm, I'm a massive, massive yes man. And I just hate saying no to anything. And, uh, can I tell you my marathon de sablers yes, yes man story then? <laughs> this will Please be do. Yours. Um, one of my, um, let's call them a subscriber or, or friend at home, mailed me to say, Chris, come on, he's a French foreign legionnaire, right? Or, or former legionnaire. Come on, Chris, march or die, me and you, marathon <laughs> of the sands. We can do it. I said, yeah, I, I know I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, but are you going to cough up the five thousand pounds for it? He said, Yeah, okay. So, okay, if you want, he said, Right, let, you know, do you want to meet me? I said, No, let's. We can meet at the start line. <laughs> if you're a tosser, I'll just leave you behind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking, friends. But uh, well, I'm sort of, you know, you've always got that option, right? So lo and behold, I managed to get two spare places because there's a two or three year waiting list normally isn't there yeah and i think it was because of let, let's not say the word that's going on at the minute because it gets us in trouble with youtube censorship but because of the current situation people a lot of people had dropped out and so i got a place for me and this guy and when i handed in the bill i never heard from him again <laughs> he blocked me on everything right oh no so being the I can't say no, I was out with a credit card. And, and so I was supposed to have run it this year, Tom. And now then they delayed it from they delayed it from the summer until September or something. Yeah. Now they've rescheduled it for next year. Yeah. So I'm I'm all ears. My question for you is these very fast um, sub-Saharan African runners. Do they wear the gaiters on their trainers? Yeah. Yeah, everyone does. You almost can't. I wouldn't recommend it. The only person I know who hasn't worn gaiters on his trainers is Duncan Slater, um, who hasn't got any legs. That was the, he, is the only, he is the only person who I would recommend not to have gaiters because <laughs> he is not getting any blisters on his feet. Um, and I, I was fortunate enough, I know, I know Dunks really well, and... We did Martin de Saab in the first year and he was the first double leg amputee to finish Martin de Saab. Um, but yeah, it's, it's gators, it's gators all the way. Um, 100%. I didn't know if that was some pansy. And I say this a lot in, in these kind of sports, you people like to be a bit elite and a bit snobbish and, and, I don't think there's ever a sport where people worry so much. Um, before entering a race you go on the forums and it's how many energy gels should I be shoving up my nose every six minutes and you know did yeah. and, and of course being military I've got the attitude as long as you've got a pair of trainers on and there's water somewhere on the course that that's you can worry about everything else later right 100 percent, yeah and I, I would I would take and I definitely took that attitude but no gators is a is a must yeah yeah you've got a very it would be like pulling on a pair of issue military boots five minutes before deploying on an exercise in the brecon beacons and being 
soaking wet for the whole thing and just feet just being completely torn apart. Yes, you could get through it, but it, it's going to be bad enough as it is. Um, make your life a little bit easier for yourself. So for our friends at home, uh, the Marathon de Sable is, it, it's, a, it's a week-long race. It's across the Sahara Desert or at least the Moroccan part of it. You're running anything up to two marathons uh, or slightly more a day. You have to carry all your own, own equipment except for water. How much did your pack weigh? Tom? Six and a half kilos. So that's yeah. you got it down to the minute. Which is which is the minute. And there is there is absolutely no need to be any heavier. Uh, I definitely could have gone lighter. Um, but there are a couple of a couple of tricks. So for example, your first breakfast on day one is obviously when you do your bag weigh-in, it's obviously included, but you're eating your breakfast before you go running. So you can have sort of a, a tin of Heinz beans and sausage or whatever you want for your breakfast. It's obviously very heavy, but you're then eating it. So you're never carrying it. Um, so there are some little, little tricks to that, but no, there is absolutely no need for anyone's pack to be any more than, than six and a half kilos. Was it really hot? I know it's a silly question, but I, I like running in the heat. It was, it, it was a different heat to what anything that I felt before incredibly dry. Um, and it's the first time that I've sort of felt breathing in the air, the air felt hot. And because the ground is so hard and so light, it reflects a lot of the heat, but it doesn't come up that high. So you've got the heat coming down. You've then also got the heat coming up. So you do feel there are certain parts that, you do feel like you're in an oven. And I think, I think we got up to like 42 and a half, 43 degrees. Um, so it, it's hot. It's not crazy, crazy hot. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just an, 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 extra, an extra element of a challenge that an extra element of something you need to deal with um, during the race. So Tom, did you leave the army to pursue this or are you still serving? No, I, I left in... July, July the 1st last year. Um, I just thought for me as an officer, I was going to be doing a huge disservice to my soldiers by spending so much time on myself. Um, the, sort of the one thing that I didn't want to happen is for my running to, to take more of a role and to take more importance than my soldiers. Um, so yeah, I, I guess that sort of kind of forced my hand to leave. So now I can sort of afford to be selfish because as a, as a professional athlete, you need to be selfish because your career is, is how well you perform in these races. And in order to perform well in these races, you need to sacrifice a lot. Um, and a lot of that is sort of pretty unconducive to, to working in a team and sort of to having sort of friends that you see every day and doing nice social things because you spend a lot of time on your own, a lot of, and then when you're not training, you're very tired from training. Um, so yeah, sadly it was, it just, it just couldn't work out. But having said that, there's no way that I'd be where I was now without the support from the British army and the Welsh guards in particular, sort of giving me the time to, to go and train while I was still serving. And suddenly my last six months of, to really go and pursue what I loved and sort of what I was, what I was next going on to and still speak to the officers and still speak to a lot of the soldiers who have on a pretty much a weekly basis. Um, well, yeah, which is, which is really nice. So I definitely know they've, they've still got my back, which is nice. And I'm guessing it frees you up for sponsorship. Am I, am I right? Yeah, exactly. It was just getting a little bit, a little bit difficult with and trail running is a very sponsorship orientated sport now because it's such a hugely growing sport. So brands want you to align with them and with the army it was just a little bit difficult and you end up sort of slightly stepping on people's toes so yeah it was just it was the most straightforward thing to do and with where I would like to get in in endurance sport then yeah it's definitely the right decision and I guess with the army as well I I was sort of kind of at the kind of at the stage where I needed to decide on what career path I wanted to go on as I was either either sort of commit and spend the next of 10 10 years serving or actually at that point is it is it time to get out and, and to, to follow something else so yeah i if i had made the if i had the chance to make the decision again would i make the same one yes 100 but 
that doesn't mean that I didn't enjoy my time in the army. I absolutely loved it. It was just, it was just time to move on. And as I think a lot of people, as a lot of people do these days, sort of you do something you love, and I would have much rather have left a year before I stopped enjoying it rather than a day after I stopped enjoying it. Oh, you very well said. You know, it, a lot of people get trapped into the forces because they realise it's not for them anymore. But the fear of going into what we would call civvy street can be very daunting. And to find something that's a good bet to, 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 to you know, that, that's quite a fortunate thing to do. Yeah, uh, I have absolutely no idea. I, had I not had this running route, I probably would have wanted to have left anyway. And I would have had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. So I probably would have stayed in. Um, as I think a lot of people really struggle and you see so many people sort of leave, try and sort of work in Civvy Street for a couple of years, but then end up rejoining because they just didn't find, they just didn't find what they were looking for. So they realised that the, gra the grass isn't necessarily greener on the other side and actually they love what they did and they want to go back to it because it's, it's normal for them. Yeah, you, you found something that's as exciting as being in the military and, it, and, and as physical and, and, if i know i know running's a solitary thing but it's still like you're a you're a team as in that you know you've got a lot of fellow performers and you form some good friendships don't you yeah definitely and i, I think massively is part of a team i guess like like the military and i definitely think if you take a if you take a unit for example you've got if you take the welsh guards for example you have the your infantry soldiers then around that you've got so if you're the signals platoon and you've got the engineers and you've got the Remy sort of to look after the vehicles and everyone's doing their specialist role. And even now as a, yes, ultra running is an individual sport. I've still got the most incredible team around me from my nutritionist to my physios, to my sports masseur, to my coach, to my strength and conditioning instructor, to my manager, to my partner, Sophie we are this great team and everyone plays their individual role in my overall performance. I, I couldn't do what I do without them. And without me, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have to do this. Um, so yeah, I think it's 100% a teamwork. And I think you realize, and in, I've definitely realized, learned the lesson of the military. Like not, there is not one person who's the best at everything. Everyone's got their own individual skills. I think one of the great, forms of leadership is finding what people are good at and getting them to do what they are good at and better than you at because then at the end of the day you come up with a better end product which yeah which is what you want you wouldn't ask you wouldn't ask your signals platoon to launch a mortar attack um and vice versa because yeah it would just end up in absolute carnage <laughs> yeah and that, probably yeah. end up in quite a lot of things if i remember our mortar mortar blue. yeah <laughs> tom let's talk about the iconic western states um a, a little bit reverse polarity there or, or um you're talking about the team you know the team is a bigger thing i as individual i love it in life taking little bits from other other achievers across and that's across the whole, every single discipline, whether it's eating, breathing, sports, writing, podcasting. In ultra running, you've got some great people to learn from. I'm thinking Scott Jurek. Um, didn't just learn a, a lot about running from him, but I learned a lot about diet. Um, Dean Karnazes, if you're talking doing super ultra silly distances, um, um and by reading such books i got to hear of this western states so it's a hundred mile race at the end it's famous because you get a buckle if you complete it in under the 24 hours and originally it was run by on it was raced on horseback but there was a guy his horse went lame and he said okay i'm gonna run it and everyone said you're crazy it's in America, it's through, through the mountains and through the desert. Um, over, to, over to you, Tom. Yeah, it was, for me, I think the 100 mile distance is just so iconic. 
because certainly from the UK, we talk about all of our distances are in miles. So it's, yeah, and a hundred is just such a round number that, yeah, and I guess it's, it's just grown. It's such a huge, huge challenge for anyone who's have ever thought about ultra running. And if you actually look on a map and you see how far a hundred miles is, whenever I see it in the car and I put it in my sat nav and I realize it's a hundred miles, I'm like, geez, I'm going to have to stop at least, it probably at least twice on this drive. And so I, I knew I wanted to do a hundred miler and I, I knew that I, yeah, I wanted to step in and step up to that distance and see what happened. And for me, I think I wanted something a little bit more than, than just performance. Um, yes, I could have done the South Downs way hundred miler. I could have done sort of other hundred milers in the UK or anywhere else, but I wanted it to be an iconic one. And I wanted it to be, to mean something more than, than just running. And for me, that the history of the race of Western States being the original hundred miler for me just meant like, right, that's the one that I want to do. I think that's, that's the one that's the most iconic. That's the one that's going to mean the most to me. And when I look back and think, right, what was my first hundred miler to be able to say, Oh yeah, it was Western States. And people are like, Oh, that's the one that's the one that they used to raise horses along and it's just for me it's having that that buy-in to the race is so important and understanding the race and learning about the race itself was um yeah it was fundamental for me for the sort of the planning process of it and yeah 100 miles is it is a seriously seriously long way would be my first would be my first takeaway um and it was a huge challenge but i think yeah as i sort of as you were in the military and i think as you do in in everyday life so if you can't just take if you get given a huge challenge at work or a huge project at work that's going to take you six months you can't if you looked at it as in one piece or if you're writing a book and if you looked at it in one piece it'd be incredibly daunting and, and a, a real challenge and very intimidating as does 100 miles look but actually you break it down and whether it's a book chapter by chapter or paragraph by paragraph or if you're doing a big project at work week by week or phase by phase you then break it, you break it down and it seems so much more achievable. And for me, that's, that was sort of my, my big mental takeaway, my big mental lesson that I learned during Western States. I just broke it down into sort of bite-sized chunks. And for me, yes, it's still, it's still a long distance. I, I broke the race down into four 25 mile races. Yes, 25 miles is still pretty much a marathon. It's still a seriously, seriously long way and definitely should not be underestimated, but for me, it just massively simplified the race. I knew it was like, right, I've just got to do four of these. Like, that's fine. Um, and yeah, I really learned, really learned there that, yes, I knew that, and I sort of would preach and I'd talk about how sort of important mental strength is for, for running. But when you actually, when you're doing something that you believe you can do, but maybe six months ago, you didn't think was possible, but you're doing it and you're then there on the finish line running the race quicker than you ever thought you you possibly could um and finishing on the podium is yeah was was just an incredible experience and yeah one of my definitely one of my fondest memories from ultra running so far um and yeah just such such an iconic race that is yeah that makes i've got a there's a i've got a big sort of frames picture in the house of my me finishing the la finishing the race of crossing the finish line um and then below it my race number and i see it every day and every time i see it it sort of does make me remember i can have if i've had a if i've had a hard run here or i've not sort of trained as well as i could have done or i'm a little bit unmotivated and i sort of look at it and sort of remember sort of the good times and sort of remember how how much how far hard work goes um yeah just a, just an incredible experience when how many times have you run the western states now is it just once the, the once just once yeah did they know because it's such an iconic event and and there's a lot of pre-build up so they're looking at this guy as a favorite or this this female as a favorite this year did they know how good you are when you rocked up there uh i think i was i was probably ranked to finish maybe in the top 10 um so, yeah, I had a I had a little bit of a reputation after after winning a couple of big races um, in 2018 and going into 2019. Um, but no, I don't think it was. No, I don't, I don't really think it was sort of expected to to be on the podium. I think it was a little bit of a, a little bit of a surprise. Like I thought that it was 
if I had my best day, then I thought that, well, it's a hundred miles, anything can happen. Um, people describe hundred mile races, especially Western States as life in a day. You go through all emotions, you go through the highs, the lows, both mentally and physically and, and anything can happen. And if you look at the ladies race last year, sort of the top, those who were ranked in the top four all dropped out of the race. Um, whereas in the men's race, it was a different story. No one really dropped out. Um, so anything, anything can happen. I think it just has, it makes you have to be even more mentally, even more mentally strong because you've got to be able to adapt to these things because you don't know, you don't know what's around the corner. And I think that's the great thing about trail running is it's not over till it's over. Um, it's not like a hundred meter sprint that you can see everyone and you can see the finish from the start. This is a twisty, turny up, down. Um, someone could, someone could roll their ankle with a mile to go and you could, they catch them with, 10 meters to go like these these things happen and i think it's yeah you've got to give your best until the very end and i think i definitely think that sort of my minute training and something that something that i learned in the military and i think it's a great phrase is as a professional athlete you're you're training to perform your best when you're feeling your best but as a soldier you're being trained to perform your best when you're feeling your worst and i think that's what an ultramarathon is. The races are finished. The races are won and lost in the closing stages when you're feeling your worst. And can I give my best performance when I'm feeling horrendous? Um, and I think that's def yeah, definitely something that I've, yeah, I've, I've pulled on in races that, yeah, I definitely take from, from my military heritage. You can always fall back on the fact that if I was doing this in the military, I'd be doing it with a hangover now. <laughs> So I'm one step up from that. <laughs> exactly. What, um, what about calorie intake then on, on the run itself? Do you practice any kind of diet in, in your modern, in, in your everyday life? Um, yes, yes, I do. But it is a very, I'd say it was pretty more old fashioned. Like I don't, I don't cut out any, any major food groups um i eat fairly normally and i say the diet my the way that my nutrition is based it's it's very similar to my training it's very periodized and and that's pretty much just done on my carbohydrate intake if like this morning like today for example i have an easy day my and like tomorrow i have a pretty easy day my carbohydrate intake is is very low um but I still eat meat and I don't really, I don't really eat anything processed. Um, and, but yeah, diet is, diet is pretty straightforward. And I think is for me, it's probably, I do a lot of things in life that are, are hard and going to, so I, for example, last year I did a two month training camp in Ethiopia. And if out there, if I had been vegetarian, I probably could have just got away with maybe but you would need to supplement a lot because there just is not like there isn't a supermarket um they don't have fridges they don't do yogurt they don't do cold milk for example so you would find it very difficult but you could probably get away with it but if you were if you followed a vegan diet or a gluten-free diet or something like that that was not medically necessary but that was your lifestyle choice. I would, you are making life significantly harder, if not impossible to do without that when you're putting yourself through so much stress anyway, just through the training. So I guess for me, I want to be able to keep consistency. So anything that I can sort of eat in the UK, anything I'm going to be able to eat sort of away on training camps, I want to be able to, to have when I'm, when I'm in the UK. So yes, I do follow a diet. I don't, I don't necessarily count calories. Um, I know I've been doing this now for long enough. I know what a serving size looks like. I know what a full serving size looks like. And I know what half a serving size looks like. Um, yes, I might weigh things like I weigh porridge oats in the morning if I've got a, a particularly hard run um, because that's what I do on a race. Um, but no, no, no sort of hidden diet or anything. I think people quite like 
either it's sort of kind of 50 50 either people want you to have a sort of secret diet of some something that you eat this and you're going to be able to do this and then other people are like oh it's just great to see that actually you're you're pretty normal with some so much talk these days of different diets and everything and i think i don't get me wrong i if i if i could and yes i i, I could it would be great and i'm sure there are there are definite the, there is definitely science that suggests that well, a couple of years ago that ketosis is the way forward and yeah. there, there is there is science now sort of that would say that uh being sort of completely plant-based would be is the right thing and the best thing for endurance but i think it, it's very it's very individual and definitely depends on your circumstances and yes if i was if i was going to be in the uk forever and i knew that i was going to have access to certain foods or not certain foods for the whole time then great like but i think for me as an elite athlete you get your main breakthroughs when you're really consistent and that's not just with training that's with recovery um and definitely with nutrition as well so i think that's a very long way of me answering so no i eat everything um but i also think it, it's so important to be able to treat yourself with food and have you I think ever it, um have you ever tested your your ph level with testing strips no I highly recommend it. The reason I say it is I was a abysmal runner in, in the military. Um, always struggle with it. Always just, you know, I obviously I always got through because to wear a green berry, you've got got to <laughs> you've got to get through it. But it was hard. It just even running with the lads for a four miler on a fizz morning, I'd be the guy not at the back, but just praying this shit was over and I could be in a nice hot shower and then you know, hopefully they send us home by 12 o'clock. But I just remember when I went alkaline um, and you can test if you're alkaline, you can buy pH strips. Tom, I'm talking to people. I'm not lecturing you. I'm talking yeah, to people, no, no, it's really interesting. people at home. And when, and when your body's alkaline, I went running and I ran. I ran a bit faster, then I ran eat, and then I just ran flat out my four miler. I couldn't, the harder I tried to run and tire myself out, the, the better I just ran. And I only thought I mentioned it because um, I talk a lot about the alkaline diet on the podcast, just because it's, I mean, n just not being ill for 17 years is, I think it's something people need to know about. And yeah. Um, when I got went to John O'Groats, even though I'd literally done no training, I think I might have run a mile around around the block. Um, I just knew I was going to smash it because you, you you get like on this cloud nine when your pH level's good. It's like a nat a real natural high. So there's my tip for you. If you yeah, I give it. I'll, but then that, that's the thing. I think you can you can learn so much from from so many different people and it's something that i've never really considered but i'm a yeah a bit of a sort of when when you use the strips it's going to tell you if your body is acidic and my my i'm a great believer in just using common logic i don't believe in fads or trends my common logic would be if your body's working the way it would be in a natural environment because your your ph is down the middle you're going to be functioning <laughs> you know, on a physical level, you're going to be functioning the way nature intended. And we are incredible human beings, you know? Yeah, no, no, 100%. On the, I'm conscious of your time here, Tom, because I know you need to get away, don't you? Yeah. Um, should we just sort of finish off then? What I was going to say is, what's your race nutrition? When you're actually running, what, what, what sort of principles do you basically stick to? So I think it's, it really depends on on the run you're doing. So for me, sort of training for an old training for an ultramarathon, racing an ultramarathon, sort of to try and become sort of as fat oxidative as you possibly can, and use your fat sources as much as as you possibly can. Um, so you end up not needing to consume that much. But take so for a race like Western States, for example, because you're still moving pretty quickly. For me, that was predominantly a liquid liquid diet. So it was sort of sports drinks, um, 
because it just yeah it just sits really well in my stomach and sort of if sort of going to sort of harder patches sort of might have a gel and most people sort of doing ultra marathons will eat real food and for a longer race I probably would but it's of any for me sort of anything under sort of 15 hours you can kind of get away with with gels and liquid um you just feel sort of pretty hungry but you're not going to get any you're not getting many stomach issues um but it yeah you just you can train for it and so by to becoming sort of slightly more fat oxidative sort of you can sort of achieve that state by sort of doing fasted runs in the morning or sort of reducing your carbohydrate intake sort of at different stages in training and as long as it's not massively affecting your performance in training then then you yeah you can get sort of huge benefits from it but yeah so I, rather than calories sort of i tend to sort of stick to sort of how many grams of carbohydrate um i'm taking every hour and sort of sit sort of somewhere between sort of one to 1.5 grams of carbohydrate per hour um of body weight so for me as if you were for example 70 kilos then you'd take sort of somewhere between 70 and 95 grams of carbohydrate per hour every hour after the first hour um I will sort of play around with it a little bit. I've sort of done some long runs, sort of very long runs, so six hour runs with next to nothing, um, just to see, just to see what my body does. Um, but yeah, I think as long as everyone's nutrition is so different, everyone's body sort of burns through burns through calories and uses different energy sources at different points. Um, and yeah, I think you've just got to find got to find something that's right and that's that's right for you. Um, and then yeah, that would just set you up for success. Do you use this? Is it called Tailwind? This drink, the power? No, I, I don't. I, I think it's really good, and the science, the science is there, and a lot of people do swear by it. I just don't. For, I need a little bit more energy than that, and it's not. So in a 500, 500 milliliters of liquid, you're only getting twenty five grams of carbohydrate, which, okay. which, which is great if you're if you're going slowly and. Mm-hmm you sort of can afford to carry a little bit more water and a little bit more liquid that's great but sort of typically the drink mixes that i'll use have got 80 grams of carbohydrate per 500 milliliters of water i don't want to be consuming that much water unless it's crazy hot but yeah typically if i was for western states for example i'd have a two two 500 milliliter bottles one of them's got a drink mix that's got uh 80 grams of carbohydrate in and so i know i need to drink that every hour and then an electrolyte's drink mix or just water um in the other bottle and i think it's yeah it's it seemed to work um so yeah don't don't sort of try and fix something that's not broken could you name a book a book tom that people listening who want to just start thinking about ultra running or maybe they they're already on their journey um what what's been one of your favorites um i good question i think that there are some really good books out um there and shane benzi um has just released uh a book uh which is really good uh but also Anne harrod finn or ad harrod ad finn has just released a book the way of the runner or the way of the ultra runner um well yeah which is really good and sort of something that i would definitely recommend people to have a read through and what's next on your horizon tom what are you, what are you building up to now so just a really good winter training block. Um, and then we'll look to, to race the British marathon trial uh, for the Tokyo Olympics, um, which is at the end of March. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll roll the dice and, and we'll see what happens there. So you, you can tune yourself to marathon distance, yeah? Well, we'll see. <laughs> well, you will, mate. You we'll, will. See, we'll see is the answer. Yes. Hmm? Are you... Yeah. Are you doing the MD, MD, MD marathon distance? Not, no? not, not next year, but I, w- I will in a year after, hopefully. Okay. I was just wondering if we could share a tent next year. but <laughs> No, maybe the year after. Get you back for a second year. Tom, you've been absolutely brilliant. On behalf of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast, thank you so much um, for coming on. Don't, don't feel you've got to hang around. I'll just click the, the off button on record here. To everybody at home, Big love to you all. Look after yourselves. If you can like and subscribe, that's going to help. Ciao, ciao. Hello, friend. I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Thrall. I'm a former Royal Marines Commando, and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction 
to live, work and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.